Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank you for being here today for our talk, Coroutines are Cute, Safer Thread Pool Interactions. Uh, in uh, this talk, uh, we will tell you about a pretty common pattern we stumbled upon uh, when designing the graphical user interface of one of our tools. And being this involved with the graphical user interface, it involves a lot of uh, concurrent of, uh, and asynchronous uh, programming, uh, which is notoriously hard, and it's hard to get right. So we want to share with you a solution we came up with, which is based on C++ 20 coroutines, and that makes possible for a programmer to uh, tackle this pattern in a way that is easy and it's very much safer and it doesn't force a programmer to uh, deal with the synchronous parallelism as usual. So uh, this, the talk is structured as follows. I will start with a brief introduction and motivation of our work. Alain, which is uh, the main uh, programmer that did the, did the heavy lifting uh, of this implementation, we show you some of examples of approaches, how you, how you can tackle this uh, kind of uh, uh, programming uh, paradigm. Then I will describe uh, the ingredients about C++ 20 coroutines that you need to understand the solution we are going to propose. And Alain will tell you about it. This solution we call uh, self-dispatching coroutines. And after that, I will finally conclude uh, there will be uh, a few minutes for some questions. So please, uh, if you have questions, wait to the end of the talk because we have uh, tried to reserve, uh, uh, let's say, 10 minutes for uh, questions at the end. Uh, before starting, let me tell you uh, a little bit about us. So both Alain and I work for a company uh, called Revenge. Alain is uh, working on the graphical user interface of our tools. I'm one of the founders, I'm the CTO, and I work uh, on the, our main analysis tool, which is the compiler. Uh, so our company, Revenge, is a cybersecurity company. We build uh, analysis tools for binary programs. Uh, so what uh, we are trying to launch very soon is a decompiler based on LLVM but with consultancy uh, on, uh, in the field of compilers and emulators. But enough with ourselves, let's start to discuss about the motivation of our work. This uh, is a pattern that we stumbled upon when designing the graphical user interface of our tool. We call it the ping pong, ping -pong pattern. I will tell you in a minute why. Uh, this is pretty common in any application that let's say it's divided in two parts. There is a front end with a main event loop that it's interfaced with the end user and a back end, which is the part of the program which is in charge of, of doing the heavy lifting and which is the part of the program that actually owns the data structures that are being manipulated from the interaction that are started from the front end, okay? So uh, typically, so this is ar arises in, a, in any application with a main event loop that you, want, uh, you don't want to block. So graphical user interfaces are one example, but also terminal user interfaces or other, any other situation where the user starts an action and you don't want to block the interaction with the user while the backend is doing the, the, the number crunching, okay? So typically the user starts asking for something to the backend, let's say to search something. So the actual task of searching for something in, in the data structure is performed by the, by the backend, which in turn uh, notifies back the results to the front end to show the results to the user. But this is just one step of the ping pong if you want. But usually what you end up doing is that you want many of those because, for example, the user wants to erase the thing that was found. So it needs to ask for another action to the backend, which actually does the uh, erase in, in this case. And again, it needs to notify back the result to the front end to update the view. Okay? So as you can see, this pretty easily becomes a ping pong. And this ping pong is executed asynchronously on many threads. You, you can imagine the work, the backend as a worker thread, but also as a thread pool. Um, but the point is that, okay, we are dealing with the concurrent asynchronous parallelism, but this chain of task is actually a sequence. They are logically connected uh, one after the other. The one depends strictly on the results of the pre previous one. So. We can call this whole chain a, a ping pong. And this reflects pretty much how typically programmer, a programmer thinks about code. So like a sequence of steps, okay? But this is not typically easy in a, when you have a graphical user interface because you, can, uh, want, you, you may want to extend this ping pong many times or, and you can have many of these ping pongs on the flight at the same time. So at any point in time, 
uh, you don't want to um, take care and to think about all the ping pongs because each ping pong is actually a, a chain of dependency and it doesn't interact with the rest of the thing. Okay, and if you start making things complicated, you can even add more worker threads, many ping pongs. So things start to become much complicated very fast if you don't find a way to reason about each ping pong separately. So this is what we wanted to do, and this is the main motivation of our work. This situation poses some challenges. Uh, the first one is, of course, that you have asynchronous execution because you don't want to block uh, the, the interface, but the tasks are actually serial. There is a logical sequence of dependent tasks. So as soon as you start using a synchronous language construct to program this, you end up with a situation where the code becomes pretty ob obscure because all these uh, asynchronous constructs make, uh, make it hard to understand and to follow the serial logic. Sometimes you don't even understand that, that there is a, just a sequence of logically connected steps, okay? And in addition to that, you have typical problems of uh, asynchronous programming. You, have, you may have data races, for example, if the worker threads uh, try to access objects managed by the main thread or vice versa, and you have to take care all the time of lifetime checks when you go back to the uh, main thread. So if the worker thread notifies an example back to the main thread and the main thread needs to show it, you have to make sure that the window where the results are going to be showed are still alive and that the user didn't close them, for example. Otherwise, your, uh, otherwise your program might crash. Uh, so this is a lot of stuff and we want to solve it in a portable way. So ideally plain standard C++ to make it portable and not to tie it to a specific uh, library or uh, operating system. So this is, uh, we found that this is quite common, uh, a common problem. And uh, before digging into the details of our solution, Alain is going to show you some of the approaches that we tried and some of their problems. So please, Alain. Okay. So for this talk, we made this, uh, this example that you can see here, uh, which is um, um, an interaction from a user with the, with the computer. And this example will be shown in uh, multiple flavors during, during the talk. So uh, at first, uh, the user chooses to delete a thing. And the UI asks to the backend for the name of the thing to show a pop-up to the user. Do you want to delete the name? And the backend searches the thing, and if the thing is found, sends the name to the UI. So the UI then shows to the user the pop up, pop up. Do you want to delete the object name? If the user clicks yes, the UI asks the backend to delete the thing. The backend then deletes the thing, and, and finally asks, asks uh, to the UI to refresh the, the view. So um, some remarks about this example. Uh, the backend and front end are not necessarily thread safe. Uh, for example, uh, using uh, Qt, uh, all the UI widgets are usually running in one thread, or the, the view is running in one thread. And actually, uh, for um, uh, in our project, also the backend uh, is working in the thread pool. And uh, if you want to communicate with the backend, you should push a task to the thread pool. And when your task is running, you're safe that you are not messing up with caches and so on. OK, so uh, the first approach we tried to, to implement the, this example, for uh, in this case, uh, is using uh, Q, uh, all the tools that Qt makes, uh, makes for us. So uh, if, uh, for uh, those of you who never used Qt, Qt is a, is a graphic framework uh, where everything, every class widget, every button, inherit from uh, the base class called Q object. Any Q object can be wrapped inside a Q pointer. If you want, you can even use the row pointers or a unique pointer, whatever you want. But Q pointer has a, a really interesting functionality. Uh, that is, uh, when the Q object is uh, destroyed, every Q pointer pointing to that object is uh, set to null, so that you can check uh, if the so that there are no dangling pointer. You can check the status of the pointer by using uh, a member function of it. Uh, and how this um, this mechanism works? Uh, this mechanism works because Qt has a notification system built in, uh, which is called the signals and slots uh, mechanism. And uh, the a signal is a notification. So any object in Qt can emit a notification. Uh, if, for example, if a user clicks a button, 
uh, a clicked signal is emitted, and every you can you can connect as programmer any signal you want to any slot, any function handler you want, so that if the user clicks a, a button, um, your code runs on the talent. And for example, if I, also if a queue object uh, is destroyed, all its connections are destroyed, and this is a very interesting feature that you want to keep. And uh, the, uh, also, the, this mechanism is the base on uh, on which the queue pointers are built. So when the pointed object is deleted, the queue pointer are notified in this way, and they start pointing to none. So using this. Um, uh, this pattern, we try to implement the, the, um, the example we have seen before. So a standard way to implement this example using Qt is like this. So there is a function that at some point is called delete thing uh, when the user clicks to delete. So delete thing pushes a task to the backend. And if you see here, because of the backend is safe to use just in the thread pool, uh, a function that is running in the thread pool has a has, uh, a parameter which is a pointer to the backend, which is is it's safe to use here. So uh, the, uh, then we ask the backend to find a thing here, and if there is at least one result, a signal is emitted, and and uh, emit is a Qt keyword to emit a signal. Uh, a signal called got the info thing is emitted. Then you, as programmer, if you want to understand how this thing works, you have to look around in the whole code base to look at. Where, where are the connections? So where is connected the signal? And then you look, you find that this connection, for example, uh, connect, which connects the signal got name for thing to a function uh, ask delete of the widget my widget. So then you look for the function ask delete, and this function works in this way. It asks a question to the user. So this is a custom method. And uh, if the user user answers positively, uh, another task is pushed to the thread pool, uh, and this task, when runs, uh, deletes the thing and emits another event, uh, sends another signal to the UI to reload the view. And then there is the last connection, reload the, the reload event to um, a function reload view. Okay, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of this approach? Uh, the main advantage is that uh, all the lifetime checks are not delegated to the programmer because the signal automatically disconnects when the, an object uh, is deleted. And it's extensible also, uh, so you can just add more signals or, and, and functions, uh, function handler, to improve the functionality, functionalities of the software. Instead, what are the disadvantages? So the main disadvantage here is that the code is scattered around. So if you want to follow a long series of ping pong between the UI, the UI and the backend, uh, you have to look in the whole code base for each step. And also, this is uh, this approach is Qt specific. So we had to do some something like this without uh, a UI, without Qt, and uh, we. In this way, we would have to implement everything from scratch. So then we tried another approach to, to do the same example, uh, which is basically by nesting lambdas. So at first, uh, here you have to keep a queue pointer manually of the local object because you want to check every time you go back to the backend that the UI is still alive because it, we are not using any more signals and slots in this way, except for the key pointer. So attach is push, pushed to, to the backend, and the backend is asked to find the thing. If there's no result, uh, exit. Otherwise, store the name of the thing inside a local variable, a uh, variable local to this lambda. And then another task is pushed to the UI, uh, which forwards the, all the parameter to the UI. And here you can see that the more you go on with the ping pongs, the more parameter you need to add into the, into the captures. So first thing to do when you go back to the main thread, check every time that all variables that you want to use are alive, then ask a question to the user, okay? If the user answer positively, push another function to the backend, uh, delete the thing, and then push another function to the to the front end and check again if the UI is still alive. For example, if the user closes the windows, the, the pointer gets invalidated. And then finally reload the reload the view. So instead, in this case, we have the advantage that the the flow is uh, linear. You can read from top to bottom and have a clear idea of uh, how the ping pong is going on. It's plain portable C++. 
and it's extensible in the sense that you can add more ping pongs, but for each variable that you want to pass, you have to add it in all the, all the captures. Instead, it has two main drawbacks, which one is that uh, all the checks are, are uh, delegated to the programmer, and um, actually, every time you have to go back to the UI, you have to check if the UI is still open, if the, all the variables are still alive, and also you can forward by mistake uh, a variable from the from the UI to the to the worker thread and uh, and, and the other way around. And that's not safe if you recall the remarks uh, I told you before. And also, uh, the fact of nesting lambdas forces the indentation to uh, grow into the right, and adding ping pongs uh, makes it even worse. So, uh, we also have a brief look at our approaches like the JavaScript promise and future way, or how STD async and STD promise future work and how other projects like uh, Chromium does, but they all, uh, they usually are, are a mix between these two approaches and they all have some drawbacks and uh, some advantages. I, each approach has its own drawbacks and advantages. Then we found a way to have all the advantages that we want without all the disadvantages. And this is by using the new C++ 20 coroutine that uh, Pietro is uh, going to introduce us in a moment. Okay, so, uh... Let's start uh, discussing about the coroutines because uh, the, the solution uh, Alain is going to present later is heavily based on that. Before starting uh, with the C++ 20 details, uh, let's just say what coroutines are uh, at a high level. So basically, coroutines are a generalization of uh, the concept of coroutines, or functions, basically, according to Donald Knuth, invented it by, uh, they are invented by Melvin Conway in 1958. And I mean, there, there, are lots, there is lots of literature on them, but to make it short, coroutines are like subroutines, but their execution can be suspended without destroying the, the execution of context uh, of, the, of the coroutine itself. And the execution can be resumed later where exactly where it stopped the last time the coroutine was sus suspended. Uh, so uh, if, we, if we want to understand it better, let's look at the supported operation from subroutines and coroutines. Uh, subroutines, the, with subroutines you can do basically two, thing, two things. You can call a subroutine and when you call it, uh, you're basically creating the subroutine context, so the stack frame. And you are starting the execution, so you are, pass me the, the, the term, you are resuming the execution of the subroutine from the beginning, which is the only place where you can start the execution of a subroutine. And then you execute it until you hit a return statement. When you hit a return, a return statement, the second operation that is supported by coroutine is uh, triggered, which is the return operation. This return operation can be seen and as composed by three steps. These three steps are returning control back to the caller. So that when you return from a function, you are yielding the control back to the, the, call, the caller function. You may optionally return also a value back to the caller, which is the return value of the function. And finally, the uh, subroutine context, so the stack frame is automatically destroyed. Uh, the main idea of coroutines is that they give you uh, finer grained access to all these steps that I mentioned that for subroutines are chunked into the call and return operation. So for coroutines, you can uh, basically create a coroutine state on the heap in C++, but without starting the coroutine right away. So you just create the execution context that is going to contain uh, the, the coroutine parameters, the local variables, and uh, let's say the program counter and so on but you, you are not forced to start the coroutine execution right away. You can, however, resume the execution whenever you want. So you, the first time you resume the execution, the coroutine is gonna start from the very beginning. And given that I already told you that you can suspend the coroutine, whenever you resume the coroutine after suspension, the uh, execution will be uh, starting from the last time the, execu the execution was suspended. So let's talk more about suspension. Uh, when a coroutine suspends the execution, all the local variables and parameters and local state is saved to the coroutine state. And then there are three possible, there are two possible ways how a suspension can be executed. By returning a value to the caller with the yield operation and without returning a value to the caller with the await operation. So yield is like, 
returns uh, control the control is always returned back to the caller but when you use the yield operator you return only uh, you return the control back to the caller along with a value which is similar to a return value except that you are not really returning you're just yielding back control and on the other case you when you await you just give back control to the caller without providing any uh, pass me the term return value and finally, you have the destroy operation, which can be invoked on the coroutine state uh, after the coroutine uh, execution has actually ended. So uh, this is very nice, but very theoretical. Let's see it in practice. I will show you a very simple example. Uh, I already mentioned that there, you can suspend a coroutine without, uh, with re a return value with the yield operator, but we will not go into the detail because it's not very uh, used in this talk. And if we start, going into every detail, you're going to run out of time. But the await operator is very important. It's going to be the, the, the cornerstone of all our design. So let's see it with the pseudocode uh, at start, because the C++ syntax is much more complicated. Um, so here you have a, a coroutine, my coroutine, with a for loop from 1 to 10. And every iteration of the loop prints uh, a number to the screen. and calls the await operator, OK? And when the await operator is called, the return, uh, the, the, the control, the, the execution flow goes back to the caller without returning any value. So uh, when main uh, starts, uh, it creates the coroutine called printer, and then iterates while the execution is not done. And every time it resumes the coroutine, when their coroutine is resumed, only a single iteration of the loop is executed. And then when the execution hits await, the, con the execution flow goes back to the uh, caller, so main in this case, for the next uh, iteration of the while loop. So if you execute this, except that we, you can't because it's not a real language, but if you could execute this, the output is going to be the following. So this is, uh, looks uh, fairly simple, and that's nice. But we already know that uh, C++ is not so simple. You might have heard that uh, coroutines in C++ 20 are pretty complex. This is what C++ does, right? With great power comes great responsibility. Uh, so we have looked into the, the, the standard and into the implementation, and we can tell you that it's not true. They are not so complicated. They are actually much more complicated. So for the uh, sake of this talk, uh, we are not going to tell everything about coroutines, we are going to focus on a, a micro portion that is necessary to implement our solution. Um, so uh, what, C++ in coroutines are available from C++ 20 that was released uh, uh, this year, uh, a few months ago. The support, despite the, the standard being uh, closed, is still experimental in major compilers. We experimented with DCC and uh, CLang. And uh, we had some problems in, at various points in time. So at the moment, we have, uh, some, uh, we have uh, an implementation working with CLang uh, 9 or 10 and using this uh, libc++, not, which is the standard template library of CLang, not one of GCC. But GCC is catching up. Uh, so in the, the support is still experimental. And another uh, a, a little problem is that um, in C++20, the library support is still very limited, so you have to roll uh, most of your classes. But the good part is that uh, the syntax is not so different from what I showed you before. It's very similar to plain old functions in, in C++, uh, with, the, with a caveat. There are a bunch of types and objects associated with the coroutines, and the standard imposes some requirements uh, on the coroutine and on its associated types. And if uh, your code doesn't uh, respect, uh, doesn't fulfill those, those requirements, uh, it's not going to compile. In this uh, respect, I can tell you that at least the last time I checked, the error messages from, from CLang were much more helpful in understanding what was wrong. But let's... Uh, Let's start looking at uh, a C++ code, uh, really. So how does the compiler know? Uh, uh, no, sorry. Uh, let's start uh, looking about what are the notable objects that the language um, says are associated with a coroutine. There are basically uh, three things. The first thing is the coroutine state. So uh, 
uh, this contains the coroutine execution context uh, arguments, local variable, like I mentioned before. This is allocated on the heap in C++, but you never access it or manipulate directly. Uh, it is only manipulated by the language under the hood. So we don't really need to care much about that, but we need to know that it, uh, it exists. The second ob important object is the promise object. This is an object used from within the coroutine to suspend uh, or yield the results to the caller. It's the main object that you have to define uh, as a user, and the language requires a given interface for it. And finally, the, the third object is the coroutine handle. This is a non-owning handle that points, let's say, to the coroutine state, and is, it can be used from outside the coroutine to control its execution. So you can resume or destroy the coroutine using the handle. Uh, one of the good things is that the, um, the coroutine handle is one of the few types that is currently provided by the standard library. So uh, you, you, can, uh, you can manipulate it and you don't have uh, to define it yourself. OK, I discussed a lot about all these objects, but I haven't told you how the compiler knows that your function is actually a coroutine. So the, the thing is that there are three new operators the co await operator, which uh, marks a suspension point that doesn't return a value. The co yield operator, which marks a suspension point that returns a value to the caller. And the co return uh, operator, which basically marks the end of the execution of a coroutine. So these three operators are uh, what the compiler uses to tell you if your function is supposed to be a coroutine. So if your function uses any of these, then it is a candidate coroutine, and uh, the compiler is going to check all the other constraints or on all the other types that I mentioned to be able to emit the code. If it can't, if uh, some of your types doesn't uh, fulfill the requirements, the compiler is going to emit an error and don't compile your um, and don't compile your code. So uh, enough with the with the language constructs, let's say, and let's start looking at a, an example so that we can start focusing on what it's important for this talk. So this is the the same coroutine that I showed you before in the pseudocode, but with C++ syntax. Okay, I want to go through this example and focus one by one on some uh, of the types and the objects that uh, are associated with it. So the, the, the idea is very simple. It's, I think you can understand it uh, from the example before. The, the C out is uh, printing the, the number, and the co await operator is yielding, uh, is uh, giving control back to the caller. But here there is an awaitable object that is the operand of the uh, co await operator that we will see uh, that is very important, but uh, we will see it in a moment. So let me tell you more about the other things that are in this slide before. So the, the, the first one is the resumable object here returned by the coroutine. There is, uh, the standard requires that the, the return value of a coroutine uh, must be a class, and it must expose a public type called promise type. So you, have a, you, you need a type def in, inside your custom defined resumable type that uh, exposes a type called promise type. And the standard mandates an interface for the promise type, okay? So the, the promise type needs to expose a given interface uh, because uh, this is the type used for the promise object and the language is going to manipulate it under the hood to suspend and resume your coroutine. We are not gonna see this interface because we are not gonna use it in this talk, but you have to be aware that it exists. The second uh, important object is the uh, coroutine handle. This is a, a type that is uh, retrieved uh, by the language when you call a coroutine. Uh, everything happens under the hood. But whenever you have a handle in your hand, uh, you can use it to manipulate the coroutine state. This is uh, a helper type provided by uh, the standard template library. So you can use a std coroutine handle and pass as a template parameter the promise type of your coroutine. And after you do this, you have access to the method exposed by the coroutine handle. And that are, there is one method to access the promise. There is one method to uh, see if the, um, um, the coroutine execution is done. There is one method to destroy the execution. And most importantly, there is one method uh, 
that I haven't put in the slide, but we're going to use it later, that is a, used from the coroutine handle to resume the execution of the coroutine. Finally, the awaitable type. I didn't talk about awaitables before because uh, I want to focus more on them than anything else. So uh, from now on, I'm going to talk about awaitables. Awaitables are the types that the co-await operator is called against. They are very important for this talk because they bake uh, the, all the logic that is executed on uh, coroutine suspension and resumption. Okay, so they need an, an awaitable type is anything that exposes uh, the, uh, a follow interface um, composed of three uh, methods. The first method is the await ready, is a method that uh, allows to check if the coroutine is ready to be executed. So the coroutine that calls the co-await operator on the awaitable object is ready to be uh, executed if this uh, uh, operator, if this function returns uh, bool, uh, return true. It's not ready if it returns false. The second uh, method is the await suspend method. Again, this method returns a boolean and takes a coroutine handle as a parameter. Uh, this method returns true if the coroutine execution needs to be suspended or false if the, it doesn't need to be suspended, so if it needs to continue execution. And again, this is uh, called on the, uh, from within the coroutine when the coroutine calls the co-await operator on the awaitable type. Okay? And finally, there is another uh, method that is the await resume method, which is called from the coroutine right after resumption. So if uh, there is a co-await uh, uh, operator called uh, on this awaitable, the execution will suspend and then somewhere else it will be resumed. And when the execution is resumed, the await resume operator will be called and it can yield, uh, it can return a value whenever, whatever value you want. So uh, let's see it in practice. Uh, on the left here, you have the, the coroutine that I showed you before. Suspend always is, is basically a, an, a, uh, an awaitable type provided by the standard that always suspends the coroutine and doesn't do anything else. So this code is actually uh, expanded like you can see on the right. So you have uh, a local variable that is uh, assigned the uh, suspend always awaitable. And then you, you call await ready on the awaitable. And if await ready uh, says that the coroutine is not ready, then you have to suspend it, calling the await suspend. And if the await suspend also returns true, means that the execution really, really needs to be suspended and is suspended here. And it will be resumed from somewhere else and it will start from the uh, very next line. At this point, the execution flow will fall through and go to the call to the await resume operator of the awaitable. That this operator can return a value. We, here it's not used, but we will use it later. So. This is uh, basically all the ingredients we need. The, co the, co -await, the awaitable types are very important because, they, like I said, they are the cornerstone of our solution and they are the custom classes that we designed and where we baked all the uh, intelligence of our solution, I think. So, Alain, now okay. we're going to tell you about it. Okay, so if you recall, what we want to achieve is that we want to write uh, um, some asynchronous code using a sequential syntax from top to bottom. We want to have the less boilerplate as possible for uh, thread migration and variable checking. Uh, we want to use it just standard C++. We don't want to use QTR or other frameworks. And we want to uh, avoid delegating all the checks for the liveness of the variable to the programmer. We want to do them automatically. So. Uh, our solution is uh, made of four steps. So the first part is uh, uh, how the self-dispatching coroutine. So this this like design uh, design choice, uh, and then the other three steps are about all the checks. So automate lifetime checks when the execution is resumed. Automatically hide thread unsafe variables when you suspend a coroutine, and automatically guard also other variables that are, they are not guarded by by point three. So, first part is uh, uh, the self-dispatching coroutines, which is the, the way we called uh, one, a coroutine that can switch automatically from the main thread to the thread pool and back whenever you call co-await. 
So we want to do something like this. There is a coroutine uh, uh, where the execution starts from the main thread, as you can see here. Then uh, a co await operator is, is uh, called with a custom awaiter, so co awaited to thread pool. That this awaiter, uh, this awaitable, switches the, the thread under the hood. Then the execution goes on on the thread pool. Then we call again uh, co await with another uh, awaitable, which is uh, to main thread that switches the thread uh, back to the, to the UI thread. And then the execution is, uh, is back to the, to the main thread. So to do that, uh, we need to bake the thread switch logic inside our custom awaitables. And we can build the awaitable in this way. So here you see just the await suspend method, which is the one interesting right now. The await suspend has the core handle. So what can we do is to uh, push the task to the thread pool inside the await suspend. So if you recall, the, the, um, the core routine is suspended right, right before executing the, the await suspend. Then we push a task, a task where we forward the core handle. The core handle is wrapped around uh, in, inside another resumable, and the execution is resumed in the thread pool. Uh, using this pattern, we can create awaitables that bounce the coroutine from uh, the UI thread to the thread pool and back. OK, so in this way, uh, the example uh, at the beginning becomes like something like this. Uh, we have here the, the Q pointer. Uh, the key pointer guarding the local widget, then the co wait is called, and the co wait moves the execution to the third pool. Then there are the, the operation we want to do on the on the third pool, and uh, in the almost uh, the last line here, uh, we can we can store a variable uh, something on inside the context of the coroutine, and this context is shared between threads. So the variable current name is can, can be used safely from the main thread. Then the execution goes back to the main thread. We have to remember to check that the um, P is not, uh, is not null to go on, so the UI is not closed. Then we ask the question to the user. If answers yes, switch back to the thread pool, perform the operation, switch back to the main thread. If the, um, the UI is not closed, the reload the view. So here we have almost all the advantages of the previous approaches. Like we have a local sequential syntax, so you can read the, this function from top to bottom and understand the ping pong flow. There is no boilerplate, so you can switch thread with, uh, with just co wait. And all the stack variables are shared between threads. It's easily extensible in the sense that you can add more ping pongs. Uh, you just write more co wait and you bounce between threads. And it's a fully C syntax. Instead, now the disadvantage is that. Uh, all the checks are now delegated to the programmer. So we start at first with the, the first problem okay, that we can solve automatically with the coroutines. So uh, for example, first problem is that the programmer still has to check the lifetime of UI object. So every time we go back to the main thread, we have to call a dot is null, uh, pointer dot is null for each variable. Uh, here you can see in this example that if a programmer forgets here, uh, a check, so the execution goes to the thread pool, goes back to the main thread. While it's in the thread pool, before going back to the main thread, the user closes the window. So when you go back to the main thread, if you forget a check, uh, the first time you use a variable that is not uh, live anymore, uh, there's a crash. So can we auto uh, perform these checks automatically? And the answer is yes. So we want to achieve something like this. So we want to have a guard object at the beginning of the coroutine that wraps all the variables. And uh, whenever you switch to the thread pool, nothing happens. But when you go back to the main thread, uh, we want the user, to, the programmer, to check, to be forced to check just the return value of the awaitable, if it's true or false. If it's false, something bad happened, a variable might be destroyed, so you exit from the full coroutine or do whatever you want. Otherwise, it's safe to use all the variables without, uh, uh, without checking them. So how can we make a guard class like this? Uh, well, we need a class with all the, uh, where in the constructor we pass all the variables that you want to guard, and a, a reference of these variables is, is stored inside the guard class, inside the tuple. And then there is just a checklife method uh, that uh, 
uses all the specialization of the wrapper class uh, uh, safe reference T, which wraps every variable that you want to guard. And uh, we specialize the, the safe reference T for both shared pointer and queue pointer, because these are the two main classes of variables that you want to, to check. And then we build the, we create the awaitables starting from the guard class so that uh, the awaitables have a reference to all the variables inside the guard class. I mean, they can call check alive to check all the status of all the, the variables. And then the awaitable uh, becomes like this. So uh, an awaitable like to main thread uh, has a, um, as first parameter in the constructor as a reference to the guard class. The await suspend is exactly the same, but actually in the wait resume, uh, the check alive method is called before resuming and the return value of the core wait is, is, if you recall, is the return value of the wait resume, which is uh, the return value of check alive. Uh, you can put, uh, if you want just a warning, you can put no discard to, um, uh, so that the compiler warns you uh, if the, the, the return value of the call weight is not checked. Otherwise, you can wrap the, the Boolean inside a class that crashes if you don't check the result before destroying it, like we did in our project. Uh, okay, so the example becomes like this. So it's almost as before. Uh, so at first you have the, now we, you have the guard here, then you have the call weight to thread pool. Um, and then when you uh, call uh, the call weight to main thread, here you use the guard dot to main thread to generate the weightable, and you are forced to check the result here. And with just one check, you check all the variables that you can put inside the this, uh, this coroutine. And after the, this this line, so after the call weight, it's safe to. Uh, to use the, the point, all the pointers inside without checking them again. And this can be repeated multiple times. So even if at the line at the bottom, we use the game call wait and check the result uh, inside here, then P is safe to use. So now we have all the pros as before with a new pro, which is that the lifetime checks are automated on call wait. And uh, the user is, uh, the programmer is forced at compile time to check the result. Instead, there is still a, a con, which is that the trade of safe variable can be accessed in the wrong thread that we are going to deal right now. So um, this is an example of what can uh, go wrong. What could go wrong. So you, we have the guard here. We go to the thread pool using the, the call weight, but then the programmer forgets to go back to, to the main thread and then uses a, a variable. And this variable may cause a crash. Can we do something about this problem to remove this problem? And yes, yeah, so we can swap all unsafe pointers with the null PTR before performing a thread switch and back when we perform the other thread switch. So we can extend the guard class in this way. Uh, we can add um, two more tuples in the guard class, one containing a PTRS, all the references to the variables in the coroutine that should be swapped with null and the memory, uh, which is another tuple that contains the value while the, all the variables in the coroutine are swapped to null. So when you swap the variable there, all the real contents go inside the, mem the memory tuple. And then there's just a method called the swap context, which, um, which swap all the variables. Uh, swap context can be called why, uh, before creating the, the waitable, or if you want, you can call it inside the, the, wait, the waitable, as you prefer. And in this way, uh, the code is exactly the same as before, but now you have another guarantee, which is that if you try to use P, for example, the variable P in this, in this example, uh, if you try to use it in the wrong thread, P is automatically set to null, so that the program crashes deterministically and you spot the bug in test and not in, uh, in release. Okay. So, uh, using this approach, what are the pros and cons? Now we also have the, that all the UI variables are guarded from the, the backend, from using them in the backend thread. But uh, the backend variables are still unchecked. And because uh, what we are doing, we are using a, call, a function called the get backend to obtain the backend that can be used also in the main thread. But actually, this function is safe to use uh, uh, only in the thread pool. So 
uh, we can use uh, the waitable to automate the logic on suspend the resume even this time. And this time what we want to achieve is this. So we want to call, uh, before uh, this approach, we call the co wait to thread pool here. What we want to achieve is that we call co wait the co wait returns a pointer to the backend, an expiring pointer. And the backend pointer then can be used inside while the execution is in the thread pool. And then when uh, the execution is back to the main thread, the expiring pointer, uh, which we're going to see in a moment, is mark, marked as expired. And that is, is the only way to go back to the main thread so that you can go back to the main thread only once and you, can, you, you cannot call this disawaitable multiple times, for example. And OK, so how is the expiring pointer implemented? Uh, the expiring pointer is just a pointer wrapper. Uh, but it has also a method mark as expired that if it's called, uh, sets the, um, the local variable expired as true. And when this variable is true, the other method stops working, trigger an, assert an assertion if you try to call them. So uh, in this way, then we change the two thread pool awaitable in uh, um, the wait suspend is like before, but we change the await resume of the of this awaitable so that it wraps the backend, calls the backend here, and then here is the only way to call the, the backend. You can change it in this way. And the, the return value is wrapped in an expiring pointer. And the expiring pointer then is needed to create the two main thread awaitable. And when the two main thread awaitable is generated, the expiring pointer is uh, marked expired. And in this way, the, the final example, our example becomes like this. So you, you have a guard here that wraps P. The first call wait switches the execution to the thread pool and returns a valid pointer to the backend, which is usable just in the thread pool. Then the programmer uses here the, the backend. And to go back to the main thread, uh, the backend pointer is needed. And now the, back point, the pointer is marked as expired. So in the UI, the pointer is not uh, usable anymore. Then in the UI, uh, you can use all the variables uh, as, uh, as before. Uh, but then when you request again uh, a backend pointer, all the UI variables are swapped back and uh, the backend is now instead uh, visible. And that's it. And finally, you could go back finally to the UI thread with the call wait and you can reload the view. So Pietro is now giving you some conclusion. Yes, so as you have seen, it's been quite a long journey. Uh, there are many steps, many incremental steps, uh, but uh, we believe that uh, we were able to design a solution that, uh, is, uh, uh, that we are very happy with because it's a pure C++20. It's not limited to Qt, so you can use it uh, with uh, some parts of our application that, uh, for example, is not based on Qt. Uh, but at the same time, it can interact quite well with Qt as the example shown to you. Uh, so the main thing that we wanted to achieve, which is the having a sequential syntax for this asynchronous execution flow, it, we got it for free thanks to coroutines. This is a big win. The main reason why we started this is that we wanted to be able to re reason about uh, sequential code because it makes it much easier. Usually, if you do that, you're going to... Uh, incur the cost of uh, the checks because you need to remember the checks. But using um, uh, custom awaitables, we were able to remove all those uh, custom checks from the uh, responsibility of the programmer. Uh, the, the checks are not removed. They are still there. But the awaitables are going to do them for you. And uh, there is no boilerplate, nor, nor for calling the co await operator, nor for calling the stack variable for sharing the stack variables between different threads, because they are just allocated in the coroutine state and they are visible uh, both in the, in the main thread and in the worker thread. So this is very nice and very easy to read. And even for newcomers, if they look at the function for the first time, they can step through it and understand how the ping pong flows. And they can extend it easily. Uh, so you can uh, you can just add code to the bottom, add more co awaits and switch threads, or you can even use more complex control flow constructs. So for example, imagine this. So here you have a switch to thread pool, and then you have a, an if statement, and in the two cases you do a ping pong here or another ping pong here, but they do different things. 
right? So, or, or you can do even this. So you can have a while loop and every iteration of the loop is a ping pong, okay? So this is pretty extensible. And uh, we, uh, we are using it uh, in, uh, in our graphical user interface and for our uh, other, for also for our terminal user interface. So uh, it's, it's not, we cannot say it's really battle tested, but the tests are passing. And given that uh, most of our approach were ba was based on uh, moving uh, race, uh, undeterministic race condition uh, and, and transforming them into uh, deterministic crashes, this is a pr pretty good uh, result, I think. It doesn't come for free. There are hidden costs. For example, uh, coroutine states are allocated on a heap, so you have heap traffic. And this can be optimized away from the compiler. But in the end, we were doing asynchronous uh, stuff, so you, you ended up having uh, things allocated on the heap anyway. Uh, you have uh, the over, uh, overhead of swapping uh, uh, all the variables to avoid rate condition and all the swaps are executed every time. This has a cost, but uh, it, it can be turned off in production. You can comment away all the swaps and enable them on, only for your, uh, for your uh, tests uh, to be able to crash your program if something was wrong. And then the, la the, the two last points are um, sadly that compiler support is still quite poor. It's, it's growing steadily, but it's still quite poor. And even if we were managed to uh, compile and make this thing run, uh, the debugging support is still not ideal because uh, uh, coroutines are not very well supported by the debugger yet. So um, that's basically it. Thank you for attending our talk. I hope you enjoyed and uh, understood everything. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, write, drop us an email or write it here now on Slack. We are, we are going to hear for a while uh, later on. Uh, we are hiring, so if you like the C++ stuff that um, uh, we have, you have seen today, get in touch. But uh, I don't want to, to uh, steal more time because now there is a few minutes for questions. So please uh, write on Slack, please, because if you uh, write all, uh, talk all together here, it's going to be hard. But uh, please, uh, we are very interested in feedback.